So, uh, in the spirit of yesterday, I just want to carry on now, just do a little introduction to myself. Um, this is going to be based on some of my PhD research, which I did at Central St. Martins. I'm now actually based at the London College of Fashion, but it's part of the University of the Arts London. So we're still part of the same university. Um, and it was practice-based research, and I had an Arts and Humanities AHRC ward for this actual work, to carry out this work. Um, but a little bit about myself. I actually um, grew up in a little tiny village in the New Forest. Um, of, the village was so small, the only thing in the village, thinking about what you were saying uh, yesterday, Vicky, the only thing in the village was the village post office, which was bigger than the counter, um, but actually my mother was the postmistress. Uh -huh. So I actually think, I was thinking a lot about this after yesterday, about what you were saying, and I think probably my whole interest and my whole um, ethical background comes from being part of a community, from being very small, you know, whenever, when the, uh, somebody elderly when the, in, the, in the village was, there was a problem, we would help out, or, you know, if, if the village got snowed in, we, we were the centre of the community, I guess, very much so. And I hadn't really, that hadn't really struck me until yesterday, so. Um, and uh, I actually, um, I'm, my first degree was ceramics, and my master's is actually contemporary jewellery, so I describe myself as a maker. Um, and I'm actually a trained teacher as well. So I went out to Botswana to teach Botswana children um, um, art and design. And I was supposed to be going for a year, and I ended up staying for nearly 12. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I'm working at grassroots level, working with communities, working with lots of different marginalised groups. So I worked with uh, the, the, one, the image on the left there is actually uh, Women Against Rape. We were working with disadvantaged women doing skills training for economic empowerment. Um, I've worked a lot with uh, Bushmen, with San of uh, the Kalahari. The group that I've worked with um, on several occasions, it's a ten, it's, it's, it can be seen as a, 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 um, a contentious term, but they actually prefer to be called Bushmen. That's what we are, that's, we, that's the name we use. So going back again to um, what, what um, Fiona was talking about with culture and who owns cultural capital and things. Um, so uh, it's generally seen in academic circles, they're generally called the sand, but actually they prefer to be called Bushmen. So indigenous groups are working with street children and vulnerable youth, and they're working in Kenya with a fair trade jewellery company. So I have a, a very varied background of working with lots of different indigenous communities. I've worked in South, South America as well, in India. Um, but going back to my, so this is my PhD. This was the title of my PhD, The True Nature of Collaboration, what role does practice play in collaboration between designers, <coughs> such as myself, designers from the West, and African craft producers? And what I was actually looking at when it came down to it was this, the actual the interaction that happens. It was practice-based, and I was looking at what goes on when we sit down as makers and we work together, and could we use this process to actually strengthen the relationship and strengthen and make a true collaboration? Um, that's Andile Diabani, who was one of the uh, who was a ceramicist that I was working with in Cape Town. I have to remember to breathe. Um, and that's us working in his workshop. And it was actually to challenge this. After living and working in Southern Africa for such a long time and seeing, particularly working with, I worked a lot with uh, NGOs and CBOs and seeing NGOs helicopter in designers to work with artisan groups. Um, in a way that I don't think that is entirely ethical. That was that I ha had an issue with this. And this is a good example of that. And it's becoming more and more prevalent. Lots of people are working from big designers such as Prada who are doing their made in uh, range of things. They do made in Bangladesh, made in Peru, made in whatever, to all sorts of organizations. This is uh, Art Technica, who are uh, an Italian design house, who have this range of products called Design with Conscience. And for me, I'm, I kind of question the name of this. Um, this piece here in the middle is actually a uh, ceramics uh, collection designed by the uh, um, Dutch designer called Helen Jorgarius with Peruvian potters. And this is their design with conscience, but that's all we know. When they're marketing this, we know about Helen Jongarius, she's very visible, but they, the Peruvian potters, Peru's huge. Where are they coming from? Are they women? Are they men? Who are they? 
And on the website, it says that they really it, it inherit it has a, the spirit of the culture in it. And for me, if you take away the caption, I don't think that looks. <laughs> in fact, for me, it looks more African. This little <coughs> beadwork on here looks quite African. So I have lots of issues with this. And for me, it's about working closely with the people. Um, to see if we could come up with something that was a bit more sustainable and a bit more successful. So I was working with two groups um, that are in Cape Town. Kunye, who are a women's group who work with recycled materials. They actually recycle waste products from um, the industry, the local industry. So lots of plastic. These are chickens made from offcuts of plastic from soup um, packaging. and. Um, and that's Princess Mizuzu who's making the chickens there. And I also worked with, as I said, uh, Emisa Ceramics. I worked with Andy Giovanni, who you saw earlier, who, who's a potter. So two different, t different groups, but um, we worked together for about uh, three years, actually, looking carefully at what happens when we sit down and work together. Because I felt that for this relationship, for it would be more sustainable if we looked at what happened together rather than it being top-down designer-led, so where everybody actually has a voice. So I was looking at participatory design processes and um, it's uh, and co-design and co-creation. So where everybody, so um, uh, Alistair Foodlook, who writes in his book about design activism, says that in, uh, participation emancipates people and make some active contributors rather than passive recipients. And that's what I wanted to uh, really interrogate, was about everybody having a voice and it actually being a collaboration. So going back to the piece from Art Technica, that was where Helen Yongarius had gone in and worked with those Peruvian potters and said, these are my designs, let's make them. And for me, there's, there's nothing wrong with that, that's employment. That's fine, that's valid, but it's not collaboration. It's not necessarily a collaborative effort. And so I was really interrogating what this collaboration would be. That's Princess again there. We did lots of things at the beginning to set up this relationship. And I'm not going to go through much, much of those methods, but they might be quite interesting another time. But we were talking about, because I'm, I'm going to be focusing on impact. But you can see in the back there, I set up agreements with everyone that I was working with. And we were looking at our hopes and our fears and our expectations for working together. And we also defined our terms, because there was no good in, in us working together thinking we both understood what collaboration was if we didn't first define those. So some of those really basic exercises at the beginning were really important to how we worked. Um, one of the main uh, proponents of uh, participatory design, co-design um, methodologies is Liz Sanders from Make Tools. And she says that as designers, we have a responsibility now that we learn to design with people rather than for people. So people are involved in what we do. Um, and yeah, that's Andina and I again working in Cape Town. And so I took this, uh, oh, sorry, that should be quiet. <laughs> Um, so, thinking again about these ways in which we work and about the dynamic of people, it was very much about people. So I'm here working with Jessica, and this is at nearly at the beginning when, we were, when I was doing some semi-structured interviews. And it was about being mindful of other people, about immersing myself in the situation, but also being mindful of other people's uh, cultural uh, culture, really. So um, in Southern Africa, it's seen as very respectful not to look at people directly in the eye when you're talking to them, um, particularly with women. Um, so we sat next to each other. I'm, I very consciously made sure that we sat next to each other. And it was, again, going back to that thing about practice, the fact that the thing that we had in common was that we were both makers. So I asked Jessica to actually teach me what she was doing. And I sat down and I worked with her. And she was teaching me what she was doing while I was interviewing her. And we were talking about her and her life and everything. And this proved really interesting because it meant that the dynamic between us shifted. It was a bit like, uh, again, with Fiona, what she was saying earlier about the dynamics of being the researcher and not imposing yourself on people. And um, it was a good way to build up relationships. She was teaching me rather than the other way around. And we were discussing what we were doing as well as actually um, talking about ourselves. As, and, and I was. Uh, it, um, eliciting information from Jessica. And uh, I did this with everyone that I was working with. Um, and then the main uh, method that I used was I took uh, cultural probes. Cultural probes is a, a method of 
gaining information from people that was developed from the Royal College of Art in uh, 1999 by uh, Geva and Dan and Paciente. And they were looking at users, they called, and so the, the people, their participants, uh, providing the information for them for their design work. And so they would give them things like cameras and ask them to take pictures of certain things and they would all have, and then they would gather this information together. So it's a bit like yesterday with the, um, with the citizen science thing, if you like. Um, but they had very specific things to do. And I thought this was a really interesting method as practitioners that, um, that we could adapt. Um, and it, as, it, as it says there, that it gives fragmentary clues about the people that you're designing for. But we weren't actually, I wasn't actually designing for Andy Lane for the women. We were going to be doing this together and co-creating. So for me, it was important to adapt this method into a way that I could actually make it work for us. And so as makers, I developed it, it was a co-creation prompt. So it was actually about making things that we could give each other and that would prompt our future work together and that would actually develop it further. So we both designed it, particularly as I was in London and they were in Cape Town. We both did, yeah, and had spending lots of time traveling backwards and forwards. We both designed uh, a piece of jewelry for each other. So there we are at the top. Um, when I went to Cape Town, we put these pieces of jewelry in front of us and then we discussed them and they became the prompts for our future work. So instead of sitting down and writing a design brief, which might be kind of quite out there and, and esoteric, we actually used objects and it was actually about our practice to co-create new designs. Um, and this worked really well. And we ended up designing, um, I'm using the Andile here because this is a, I think this actually summed up our, um, the whole cross-cultural collaboration. So we have a European uh, silversmith, a metal worker, jeweler, myself, and we have an African ceramicist, and we ended up designing something that could be traditionally seen as Asian. <laughs> so, and, but it also speaks of all sorts of really interesting histories and traditions that we both bring to this. And I think that this really summed up cross-cultural collaboration for us. So this was a, a porcelain noodle bowl that Andile made, and this is my um, sterling silver chopstick holder to go with it. And um, this little mark here that's made from the, the cable tie that we used for this, to me, speaks a lot about that historical um, tradition of ceramicists, where Western ceramic potters going working in, in Japan and um, having their little uh, maker's mark as well. So there's lots of interesting things that are going on here. And because my first degree was ceramics as well, we kind of it was interesting that things developed in this way. So. Um, and Tuli Matlamaki, who's a, a Scandinavian uh, participatory designer, talks about that uh, co-design and co-creation is a way of interpreting and sharing information, and that definitely worked with us. So um, going, to, going on to impact and thinking about this, when I was doing this, because my PhD was practice-based, it was always implied, it was inherent in this, that I was going to have an exhibition because the, the, the submission of my thesis would be, a, uh, or my, my PhD would be a thesis, a written thesis, and then a body of work. And how would I do that? That would be through an exhibition. But about a year in, after traveling backwards and forwards to Cape Town and having to negotiate with two different groups and having to manage that process, I thought, how are we gonna do an exhibition? Do we really need to do an exhibition? This is gonna be an awful lot of work and, and management and organization around this. And actually, um, because of the participatory nature of this, it, it, it actually it was important that we did have an exhibition. Um, and so we approached the, the National Gallery in, in South Africa, Cape Town, and they agreed that we could, they would hold our exhibition, which is fantastic. I and mean, this is an amazing place for the women and Dile to show their work. It really elevates their work and puts it on a different platform, which was really important, actually. Um, but the main reason for holding the exhibition, there were several, is that it was really important that we had the that we um, we had a conversation with the stakeholders because this is an area that involves a lot of people. It crosses over many areas. It crosses over development and sustainability. There are lots of NGOs working in this area. There are lots of uh, CBOs working in this area, and it was really important that we we provoked a conversation with the stakeholders and we got their feedback. Um, it also meant that we could show. Uh, the problems and successes and the consequences of our working together and have a, a dialogue with, with people. Um, it provided great networking opportunities for uh, Andile and the women to be able to continue 
with conversations with other people and set up other collaborations for the future, and we're able to show what we'd actually developed. But that wasn't the main reason for it. So that's, that was great, but how do we actually do that? How do we get the feedback from the stakeholders in an interesting way? How do we see what impact we've made? So um, we set up the exhibition, and actually, they gave us, I normally make jewellery. My jewellery is normally about this big. And Izika, the South African National Gallery, gave me a room that was 10 metres by 10 metres. It was enormous. So I actually set up a, it was a research exhibition, and it showed our journey. And it was a, a journey that people go, go on and walk around the whole room to see what we'd actually done. And to do that, I developed these big um, banners, which I actually ended up having printed in the UK and taking out with me. And they broke down the, the, the process that we'd been on, and they, they um, presented our work to a non-specialist audience. And it was also, we, we um, showed artifacts, some of the things we'd made, some of the jewellery, um, some of the pots. We had video, and we had uh, photos. It was a very multimedia exhibition. And, um, and it, it was, uh, I worked with a graphic designer who produced these, uh, actually an MA student from St. Martin's. Um, and that, was, that was part of it. So you can see, you can walk around, and there were lots of different artifacts and things that were going on. But how do I get the feedback from the stakeholders and in a really interesting way? I didn't want to give people questionnaires. That doesn't elicit, <laughs> that doesn't really help generally. And um, to, to judge impact. So I developed what I called Collaborate TV. <laughs> And I got uh, students from the Cape Peninsula University of Technology, film students who came and worked for us. And they filmed the, uh, they, well, actually, with this, this room at the end here. So uh, in our enormous 10 meter by 10 meter, we had this small square room in the corner. I don't know if you can kind of work that out at the end there. We turned that into an on-site TV recording studio. And then the big monitor at the back there, which is behind Dexter, the camera guy, um, what we did was they, the Dexter and his colleague set up this filming studio inside there. And they filmed interviews with the stakeholders and they live streamed them directly into the gallery on this, this monitor here. So that the stakeholders not only gave us their feedback, but they became part of the exhibition. They became part of the, co the conversation and the dialogue. But also everyone wanted to do it. It was great. Everyone wanted to go in and give us their feedback, which is fantastic. One of the hardest things normally is to get people to comment on it, but everyone wanted to be part of the exhibition, so it worked brilliantly. Um, I've got a picture of here. Unfortunately, I didn't take any photos at the time. I'm a bit annoyed about that. But so you can see that's the room there. And we had the monitor on the, on the side there. And, um, and then I had those videos and the, those interviews that I was able to, to transcribe and put, and put that information, synthesize that information back into my thesis. Uh, just out of interest, what's going mm. on on the right there? Is that mapping relationships? That's mapping, yes. That's actually a map of, so this was the, you entered the exhibition and this was the doorway here. And that was actually the uh, part, it's only a part of the Western Cape craft and design scene and how people are interlinked. And for me, what I wanted, and this is for people, so it was again, it was interactive, so the stakeholders could add where they are on here. But for me, what was really interesting about this is that everybody's working with the same people and nobody's talking to each other which was another thing we addressed through the Collaborate TV. And through this exhibition, that's why that was so, it was so important. It wasn't just a, this is what we've done. So, um, and uh, I did it with um, wool, so it was kind of craft, kind of craft-based as well. But, um, yeah. but it, yeah, so that was. Um, oh, and so, so that was the uh, impact from the stakeholders, but what about the impact from the people I've worked with? There were lots of really interesting things that I could see that were developing over our relationship and over our time um, working together. And Andila and I, Andila came to, a bit later on, I, so I had the exhibition in Cape Town. Uh, it was a World Design Capital 2014 official project. And um, we were able to bring it over to London. And for me, that was brilliant. St. Martin's hosted it because that really felt for me that it was truly collaborative then. So we were showing the exhibition in Cape Town, we were showing it in London. And I got more money from the HRC and brought Andy Lee over to the UK, and we had a, which was really great. And we had a, a symposium and a workshop around some of these things. And again, that was a really good way of, of, uh, of judging impact as well. So I had other speakers who came who'd worked in Africa in craft projects, and we were able to Andy Lee and I together 
were able to present our work, which was really good. And then while he was there, we uh, also um, recorded a, a half-hour video of us talking on collaboration. And I'd just like to show uh, just a little part of it, if you don't mind, just a really quick, uh, and then talk about impact. Ubuntu, Ubuntu, for me, I think, I, it, it, it's very hard to explain it because it's, it comes naturally to me. It's something that I grew up in because it, it, it's in my culture, it's in my nature. And we, you, you grow in a village and you, not only your parents, child. Stuff like that, and people will come in and and assist you in 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 in, in planting and weeding and you know growing the crops. And in the, in the return, what you do is because they don't have that the, the field, then you give them the food. So so there's always that thing like umundo umundo ngabantu that that umundo umundo ngabantu that that this guy really is about. You cannot be. In English, probably it says no man is an island type of thing, yeah. right? Yeah. So, so we, I, yeah. it, it, that, that, I, I'm looking at it, that. In fact, one of it's, it's uh, passing on to people. Exactly, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, by, by, that, that, you know, that applies a lot in terms of, I don't know how it came about, but because, because if I give you, so if I help you, you gonna help other people, so it's it's that thing of you know this one person, and then because of what you have, because of what you capable of doing, or you, your well being is gonna assist all these other people. But you being assisted, so the same thing applies. It's like the, the paying for what thing. It's it's it applies also in the same thing. You know, it. Uh, so for me, that's that's what Ubuntu is about. Is 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 about enriching, you know, each other. And, and if you are enriched, then the next person is going to be whichever way, spiritually, could be in a nutritional sort of way, it could be, you know, because I'm clothing you, I'm, you know, it comes in, in all different forms. In our case, it's, you, you are enriching me spiritually, and in that way, I'm able to enrich other people. And, and so, 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 so the same thing with me in agreeing to you um, that let's do this. It's your documentation. It's, it's you. You're going to graduate to a next level. I've agreed to that and I'm assisting you and, and in, 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 that, in that sense. And, um, and then if you, when you do graduate and, and with this process, that's going to enrich a lot of other people as well. Because the public and the, in, is going to have access to this and, and so on and so on. And with our product, all the energy and effort that we've done, you know, we've, we've put into in, in, into all these things, it's going to educate and people in terms of the process. But spiritually, these are going to speak volumes. You know, that's what the wound for me is about. It's, it's I can't describe it in one word. And another person is going to have, you know, a, 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 a different um, explanation and interpretation of it. And 
just a little bit of that film. It's actually half an hour. We, we edited it. We actually sat talking just about collabor our collaboration for quite a long time. Um, looking at the, the wider impact, let me just go back to my uh, presentation. So this is something that Andile has been doing recently. He's actually set up a COSA design uh, initiative. So he's working with other COSA designers, and they've been exhibiting and working together and, and uh, celebrating their own work. And I think, for me, that's a really um, important because it actually shows he's going to be taking some of the things we've been doing and actually working in, in traditional, uh, with some of, uh, yeah, traditional, traditional cultural designs, um, which I think is really important. Um, and uh, I think that's about it for now. Thank you very much. Yeah. So, I'm sure there's plenty of questions. Any questions for Sarah? Okay. Uh, the question I have, which goes back to where you, you started, is in, how. how Presumably, a lot of these issues are affected by commercial considerations and what market you're mm. is designing for. Mm. And I, I guess one of the lines in some of these NGO partnerships that you talk about is, oh, you know, we we help the the participants do designs that actually have a market in rich countries and so you know, if they're mm. exporting that design then that puts the helicoptered in designer in a kind of um, in, a, in a position of power that it's very hard to be for the participants to challenge because you know, I arrive there and I say well you know, sorry that's not going to sell in London but mm. this is and so on so doesn't that create a, a tension that's very hard to resolve? Well, I think actually what you've hit on there is really important, actually, and that's something that I, uh, I also have an issue with. It's, uh, there's, there's never any legacy left when people go in generally. Um, and so, for example, uh, Hansi Craft, the, the Bushman group that I work with in, in Hansi, they had a, an Ivorian, uh, French Ivorian designer came from Paris who worked with them on some designs. And um, at the end of it, he went back to Paris and they said, but we, what have we got? We've got it, it, we were making things at Haute Couture. We're never gonna be able to sell Haute Couture. You know, we have a tourist shop on the edge of, uh, the, edge of the Kalahari and we sell, to, we sell to tourists who are coming on safari. We, and, we don't, and also, he took all the samples with him. He didn't leave them with any of the samples and that's generally what happens. Um, and then the, the other thing is that it's generally that designers are coming in because NGOs are bringing them in to sell for a particular market. But without the market or without the, without the designer or without the NGO, there isn't a market. So for me, it was more about uh, empowering people to be able to uh, come up with a method of working that would be beneficial for them and that they would have a say in it so that when the next NGO or the next, the next designer came in and helicoptered in... There's a really uh, that they, they they would have they would able to be have a voice and they would be able to be fully participatory in that process, which I think is really important. And my theory was that by doing that, the products would grow out of that naturally rather than them being imposed. And that's actually what ha did happen with Andile and I. And as you can see, he's gone on to work with other designers locally. I think a really good example of uh, I, and 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 mostly the the intentions are very obviously very. Um, positive ones from the NGOs or the designers generally, but they're maybe not completely thought through. Um, Flori Salnut from the Royal College of Art did an amazing project um, with Sahari women um, in refugee camps. Uh, and she developed a way of making jewelry, filigree jewelry from plastic bottles that they could sell. But I, I spoke to her and she said, but now I've gone, they have no way of selling any of this. And also it caused all sorts of problems in the refugee camp because suddenly they were the ones that had a bit of money because they were working with her and the NGO were coming in and they were helping. So there's dynamics there as well. So it's about looking at, for me it was about looking at the whole picture and about how we could maybe 
tackle this from a ground up um, issue. And, and I think that the whole issue of having, uh, having the market to sell is a different one. And that's generally where the NGOs come in because they come in from a business perspective and a business angle and they work as the middle middleman and the marketeers. And that wasn't what this was about. And um, yeah. So what, what was this being produced? Was the work that you were doing being produced for sale at all? And then what kind of market? Yeah, uh, with the women and I, we, we developed uh, a range of jewellery that actually they, they, they sell and they work, they work with a local jeweller now. But they, they now can able, they're able to broker that and negotiate that themselves. Or when NGOs come in and are involved, they can actually, it's, it makes it more successful and more sustainable. Um, definitely. And, and Dina and I are hoping we were going to put our, our tableware into production. We haven't done that yet, but that's hopefully for the future. And again, as, as we were saying yesterday, uh, um, about Ashington and, and the, the group in um, Australia, we're hoping that this will continue in a different form, our, our collaboration in a different form. Mm. Because um, the language he was using was the language of assisting you, whilst the language you used in your presentation was the language of assisting him. And I yeah. think that's a fantastic match. So it's an observation okay, rather great. than a question. But Thank you. Your comments on that, yeah. so the observation. I thought there was a really quality in that. No, that was really interesting. Thank you. And I think one of the things that I quoted from, uh, and uh, that's always stuck me with, with me, was Andele said several times about the fact that for him, collaboration, the results might not be now. They might be many years down the line. And suddenly you go, where did that come from? Ah, oh, that came from when I was doing that. Or it might be next week, or it might be. And I thought, I thought for that, I really like that as well. Mm. Yeah. Um, <coughs> I don't know very much about Ubuntu, but I've heard that they were going to put it into the Constitution, South African Constitution, then it, for some, I don't know what for, but it didn't go in, some aspects of it. Mm. And I know this is a hypothetical, but it's just, it's hard to mm. say anything, but um, if it had been, would it have made any kind of, you know, what kind of a difference would it have made to it is actually collaborations and research and all sorts yeah. of um, it is actually in. It's in one of the white papers, the government white papers from the 90s, uh, um, from when it was the early on in the, the the new government. So, and it is actually. It it's one of those terms now that has. It's 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 everywhere now as well, and you have to be a bit careful with it. So uh, there's people who have, you know, cement companies that are called Ubuntu, or you know, it's 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 kind of you know, and most people think of it as being the the, the software, the coding, the the, the who was Mark Shuttleworth, a South African, who set that up and wanted it to be open source, so called it Ubuntu, but so it's about um, it is everywhere now, and it is about what how it's used and people's definition of it. But um, I think it's also interesting in my conversation with Andile and the women about this, they, they talk about how it's changing. And I think it's that thing of, you know, the modern, modern world, um, they're all slightly older, the women are slightly older as well, and they're saying that, you know, their children and maybe they brought them up with Ubuntu, but they're, you know, they're no longer living in the village, like Andile was saying, they're living in the town or in the townships. So it's that kind of, it's a shifting, it's a changing thing. Um, I, I knew nothing about, and I still know nothing about about the, the made in Bangladesh and the, the, mm. this, this movement. Can you just say a bit more about that? I mean, it, it, it sounds initially as if it's as it were a good idea because it brings yes. work and so on, but but then it all seemed to have a slightly dark side, shall we <laughs> say? Um, it's it's. I mean, it's been ongoing. It, it's. <laughs> for many years and in two, two different forms. So uh, governments seeing it as, um, as craft in rural areas being a panacea for rural poverty. So wanting to bring in, so wanted to help develop that. And in South African governments definitely seem to think that that's true. Um, and then you've got organizations such as Tradecraft. Oxfam used to, but not, no longer, used to take designers out and, and work with rural groups so that they could develop yeah. product. Yeah. But it comes back to that thing that was mentioned earlier about who is your market? Yes. You can't, yeah. you know, and how do they get that to the market? And that's the, the really, that's the, that's a really but difficult thing when Tradecraft is, sorry. Uh, yeah. Broader, yes, well, that so that's so, so that's the one thing, and then then with uh, design, it's if I'm a bit cynical, it's it's seen it's a little bit like greenwashing, I guess. 
in a way that it's a, it's a kind of marketing tool, I guess. And um, so, uh, yeah, Prada have this, they have several, they have this made-in range that's several, so they'll have a, a made-in, uh, made in India maybe, which is hand-embroidered um, and that kind of thing. Um, it's flagging up where that's come from. It's saying the provenance of that work, which is good, but it's my, my issue is with things where they're actually promoting it. So like the art technical where it's actually being promoted as we're doing this, we have a conscience about our designs and where they come from. And actually, when you interrogate it really, why is Hella Jongarius having, why is her name on this? It's like what we were talking about earlier about you know, the Bolivian group with the, it's the cultural capital belongs to the potters, surely. And, and Hella as well, together. Um, and, you know, lots of people... Vivian Westwood has just brought out a range of uh, leather bags that she's made in Africa. Um, again, it's that made in Africa thing. OK, Africa's huge. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> you know? Exactly. And so, you know, that's... There's, yeah. And it's... Um, I think it's also... There's, there's been a huge rise over the last 10 or 15 years, particularly in, in the... Um, with globalization and the people's quest for authenticity and they're wanting that hand handmade and the kind of luxury area, but we want it handmade and so there's there's that thing that's where Prada and, and people like Vivian West would yeah, come in. That's, yeah. the, that's what brings them in for that. Yeah. For the conscience and the sort of um, Well, I suppose the, the conscience. Well, yeah. like, <laughs> hard to speak scare quotes for, yeah. the, for the conscience. <laughs> <laughs> the conscience. Yeah. Um, and and the the, the Mm. Okay, mm. thank you. You'd be amazed. No, I don't buy from Vivian West. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm more of a sort of British homeschooled kind of girl. <laughs> <laughs> so that's interesting. Thank you very much. Just a comment, um, something that Morgan said yesterday about the whole sort of groundswell of movement about on social media and technologies allowing people to have discussions about kind of these some issues. and. A thing with fashion, was it a couple of months ago there was that Who Made My Shirt campaign on Twitter? Did you did anyone see that? And basically you people were doing selfies with their labels, um, with their shirts on back to front Turned so you could see the label. Yeah. And it was and, and they were it was hashtag who made my shirt or something like that. Yeah. And so the produ the the companies who Marks and Spencers or whoever they were were able to come in and say, Oh actually, well, this is made in this factory and whatever and it was just trying to I know. I just thought, actually, this sort of the whole crowd sourcing of information. Mm. I think that there is this sort of within a certain sector of society, there is this renewed interest. And in actually, where going underneath the story of the made in Bangladesh mm. or the literally mm. it says Bangladesh on mm. my, you know, on my label, the story behind all mm. of that. So. But that whole campaign was a response to the Rana Plaza. You know the the Bangladesh factory yeah, that came exactly. down, and that was a response to yeah. that to kind of go, what do you people? So it wasn't to make people aware, really. Yeah. It was an awareness campaign. Absolutely. And it's I, I saw it the other day. I don't know if you know Trade, who's that that company that uh, do is an NGO that that have it's a charity shop, but they actually take clothes and then they rejig them in some way, repurpose them in some way, so they might make them into something different. They sell them. Mm -hmm. And I walked past their shop in um, West London the other day, and they had labels. I think it was on the same day, maybe. They had labels on everything saying where they'd made and what, where they were from. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. uh, I suppose just one, one last comment. You talk about various forms of reciprocity, uh, not simply mm -hmm. in front of people, but sort of like work for putting in these, these products. Um, mm -hmm. In Ireland, we've got the concept of metal, which is um, also grounded in collective action or uh, forms of reciprocity. Do you think there's a an underlying value set which gives rise to those kinds of interaction, or is it just something which is are, are, are these each independent phenomena in, um, which are incapable of comparison? Yeah, that's an interesting one. I mean, for me, I was really I thought it was because after spending so long in in Botswana, I. Um, I used to travel down to South Africa, but Botswana didn't have the scope for me for the for the PhD. I did my master's research in Botswana. And I obviously knew Boto, but I didn't know about Ubuntu so much. And so it was interesting to go and find that there. And I think I think it's probably the whole of Southern Africa has different forms of that. And I think that probably just goes back to the whole just that communal living, you know, we used to live in extended families. Everybody used to look after each other, you know, villages, probably in Ireland it's the same. Everyone knew each other, and now you know. Now with urbanisation, we've, we've. So I think it's more of a generational thing. We're going back yesterday to generations. Yeah. 
I think so. Okay, thank you.